Good day and welcome to AFIMED's second quarter 2021 financial results and corporate update conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode, so if you require operator assistance, please press star then zero. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star then one. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded. I'd now like to introduce your host for today's conference call, Alex Fudukides, Head of Investor Relations at AFIMED. Please go ahead. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'd like to also welcome you all for joining us today for our second quarter 2021 results and operational update call. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we issued the relevant press release earlier today and that it can be found on the Investor Relations section of our website. On the call today, we have uh, the following members of our management team. Dr. Adi Hurst, our Chief Executive Officer. Andreas Harstrick, our Chief Medical Officer. Arne Chatilius, our Chief Scientific Officer. Wolfgang Fischer, our Chief Operating Officer. And Angus Smith, our Chief Financial Officer. The whole team will be available for the Q&A session. Uh, before we start, uh, quickly to go through the safe harbor statement. Today's discussion contains projections and forward-looking statements regarding future events. These statements represent our beliefs and assumptions only as of the date of this call. Except as required by law, we assume no obligation to update these forward-looking statements publicly or to update the reasons why actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statement, even if new information becomes available in the future. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, and actual results may differ materially from those expressed or implied in the statement. And these statements, due to various factors, including, but not limited to, those identified under the section entitled Risk Factors in our filings with the SEC, and those identified under the section entitled Forward-Looking Statement in the press release that we issued today and filed with the SEC. With that, I'll turn the call over to Adi. Adi? Yeah, thank you, Alex, and uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks a lot for joining in for our second quarter uh, update call. Today, we're going to provide an update on our pipeline, discuss the program, progress on our ongoing AFM 13, AFM 24, and AFM 28 studies, and our plans for what promises to be an exciting period over the next few months for our company. Um, before I do that, a quick summary of what we have accomplished so far. In the clinical and preclinical data confirm that our unique and innovative inner cell engagers are safe and have the potential to be effective in treating cancer patients, both as monotherapies, but also in combination either with natural killer cells or with checkpoint antibodies such as PD-1, maybe pd one as we move the ongoing clinical trials forward, our efforts are now focusing on identifying and targeting indications where we believe our scientific discoveries will benefit patients by applying our three-pronged approach, monotherapy, therapies in combination with natural killer cells, and checkpoint inhibitors. We're very happy to report that our pipeline remains on track. For our registration-directed study of AFM-13 monotherapy in relapsed refractory peripheral T-cell lymphoma, uh, we are recruiting well and on track to complete enrollment of the study in the first half of uh, 2022. And we expect to be able to provide further guidance about timing for data as we get closer to the completion of enrollment. In the investigator-sponsored clinical trial at MD Anderson Cancer Center, evaluating cold blood-derived natural killer cells pre-complexed with AFM-13, we have completed the dose escalation part of the study with increasing uh, doses. Indeed, there were three cohorts where we used either 10 to the 6 cells per kilogram, three patients that received 10 to the 7 cells per kilogram, and three patients that receive 10 to the 8 cells per kilogram. We're currently enrolling additional patients at the highest dose, 
of uh, 10 to the 8 cells per kilogram to gather a robust data on safety and efficacy, what would form the basis for discussions with regulators about appropriate approval strategies. No dose limiting toxicities have been observed during the dose escalation in any of the three cohorts, and we remain encouraged by the observed response rates. The next data update is planned for the fourth quarter at a major medical conference. Regarding our efforts to take forward the combination of AFM13 with natural killer cells into a registration directed study, we have signed up a CDMO for the manufacturing of the NK cells and have generated additional data on cryopreserved natural killer cells pre-complexed with AFM13. As we have shared with you over the past few months, we view this car-like and K characteristics of our inert cell engagers in combination with natural killer cells as a major advantage over monoclonal antibodies. The major difference being that when we look closer at the cell surface retention, our inert cell engagers won't fall off the combined therapy for a very long time, including days later whereas monoclonal antibodies are not retained for very long. As a result, our research shows that it is not possible to generate a pre-complex product with monoclonal antibodies, but with inactive engagers only. Moreover, our research demonstrates that the engagement of our inactive engager molecules with natural killer cells activate the natural killer cells to kill tumor cells. In our collaboration with the Karolinska Institute, we found that AFM13, when compared to a monoclonal CD30 antibody, mediated a more potent activation of natural killer cells, leading to a significantly increased number of natural killer cells that exerted engagement with multiple target cells, rendering these NK cells serial killers. This exciting data has been accepted as a poster presentation at the SITC annual meeting in November. In our ongoing trial with MD Anderson, it is our goal to generate a strong data package that would support discussions with the FDA and other agencies regarding next steps for the program, including a potential registration directed study. Now let me turn over to AFM24, our EGFR directed inactive engager. For AFM24, we continue to execute our three-pronged strategy of monotherapy, combination with natural killer cells, and combination with a checkpoint inhibitor PDL1. Our goal in this program is to evaluate a broad set of solid tumor indications in parallel, supported all by a strong biological rationale. We expect multiple inflection points this year and plan to have multiple additional data readouts in 2022. Our monotherapy dose escalation study is on track. Based on current data, cohorts five and six are pharmacologically active doses. Therefore, we have increased the size of cohort five. Patients are dosed at 320 milligram and cohort six patients are dosed at 480 milligram to generate additional pharmacokinetic and pharmaco dynamic data that we expect will aid our selection of the recommended phase two dose. As of today, in each of the cohorts, five and six, five out of six patients are enrolled. It is important to mention that to date, in patients that have already completed the DLT period in each cohort, no dose limiting toxicities were observed. So as just mentioned, we continue to see a good safety profile of AFM24. We confirm that we have not seen any of the classical EGFR-related side effects, like uh, apneiform skin rash or mucositis. This is in line with the distinct mechanisms of uh, action of AFM24, which is very different from the mode of action of EGFR pathway targeting antibodies like cetuximab or panitumumab. These findings also confirm the data from our pivotal toxicology studies in dynamolgus monkeys that indicated 
a different side effect profile for AFM24 versus Tutuxin. Infusion-related reactions remain the main side effect and are well manageable with symptomatic treatment and modifications of infusion rate. The ongoing dose escalation part includes patients with any EGFR expressing solid tumors. When assessing anti-tumor activity at those levels in the 320 milligram and 480 milligram cohort, we are encouraged to see that there were several patients on the study that experienced disease stabilization beyond eight weeks and were able to receive additional cycles. Biomarker analysis of the patients point to the activation of effector cells shown by increasing expression of activation markers and a continuous secretion of cytokines. Indeed, supportive of this observation is a continuous occupancy of the CD16A receptor. We are enrolling patients in the monotherapy study and independent of the selection of our recommended phase two dose we plan to continue to increase the dose in non-selected patients to gather further insight into the exposure effects relationship of AFM24, focusing on PD markers, and to confirm safety of AFM24 at even higher dose levels. Important now to note is, in addition, in line with our guidance, we expect now to start enrollment of indication-specific patients in the expansion cohorts using single-agent AFM24 in the second half of 2021. These cohorts have been chosen based on a detailed analysis of the tumor biology, as we explained in the past, and will enrich for patients that we believe have a high likelihood to respond to single-agent AFM24. These expansion cohorts include, will include renal cell carcinoma, that failed standard of care, which includes TKIs and TD1 targeted therapy. Second indication is non-small cell lung cancer, EGFR mutant, failing standard of care, TKIs. And the third indication is colorectal cancer, failing chemotherapy plus EGFR targeted antibody. So we have selected three indications for the monotherapy study. In addition, we're now in the final stages of the setup phase for our combination studies of AFM24 with both atezolizumab, studies called AFM24102, and the autologous and CASEL product SNK01, the study is called AFM24-103. We confirm our guidance that we expect both of these studies to start, uh, start enrolling patients in uh, 2021. The tumor types we plan to study with the AFM24 uh, ATESO combination are as follows. Again, non-small cell lung cancer, in this case, EGFR wild type, failing chemo and PD-1 targeted therapy. Gastric and uh, GEJ cancer, failing standard platinum-based chemo, and a basket of EGFR expressing uh, tumors comprising pancreatic hepatocellular, and biliary tract cancer, again, failing standard of therapy for the respective species. Now, the tumor types we plan to study in the AFM24, SNK01, in case of combination study are as follows. Again, non-small cell lung cancer, EGFR wild type, squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, failing chemo and PD-1, and colorectal cancer failing standard of care. The indications for each of the three studies have been selected carefully based on the biology of each tumor type. This approach allows us to investigate a broad set of solid tumors while also providing multiple shots on goal for the more prevalent tumor types such as non-small cell lung cancer and colorectal cancer. In summary, we're very satisfied with the progress of the AFM24 program. The data show that AFM24 possesses a different mode of action compared to conventional EGFR targeting antibodies. We see pharmacological activity based on CD16A receptor binding and NK activation markers. At these pharmacologically active doses, we see no classical EGFR 
related side effects like skin mucosal toxicity. And in addition, we were seeing disease stabilization in these heavily pretreated patients at those levels 320 milligram and 480 milligram. Um, we believe in the significant potential of AFM24 and with a planned expansion of the program, we're seeking to maximize this opportunity, addressing a broad set of major EGFR expressing tumor indications. And this strategy will allow us to provide a continuous flow of data. Now let me move to the third program, AFM28. For AFM28, we continue to advance the IND in ABing studies and have submitted an abstract with initial preclinical data for a major medical conference later this year. We plan to release information about the target and the indication once the abstract becomes available. We remain on track to submit the IND application in the first half of 2022, and our goal is to begin a clinical study in the second half of 2022. In addition to moving forward, things forward in the clinic, we're continuing to publish data that supports our work. One such example is the recently published preclinical data that supported the IND filing, IND application of our inertialing HIA from 24 in the journal maps. Arndt, our CSO, will discuss the key takeaways from the publication, from the publication. Arndt. Thanks, Adi. And also for me, a very warm welcome to everybody on the call. As introduced by Adi, I would like to summarize the key preclinical data for AFM24 described in the recent publication in the journal MAPS. In this paper, we demonstrate the high affinity binding of AFM24 to CD16A on natural killer cells and macrophages with strong binding values in the low nanomolar range. Importantly, AFM24 binds to CD16A on NK cells and macrophages with high affinity at a site that is distinct from the binding of IgG, such that high concentrations of polyclonal IgG results in a minimal, only two-fold reduction in binding affinity in contrast binding of an FC-enhanced high-affinity anti-EGFR IgG antibody was significantly inhibited. These data again demonstrate the high surface retention of RIC molecules to NK cells, enabling the earlier described pre-complexing to NK cells with CAR-like NK cell properties, which are not possible with normal or FC-enhanced antibodies. We also show high affinity binding of AFM24 in the nanomolar range to various EGFR expressing tumor cells. AFM24 demonstrated to be highly differentiated from marketed anti-EGFR antibodies with its ability to potently and effectively kill tumor cells through antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity or ADCC, RNK cells, Moreover, this ICE-mediated potent antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, or ADCP, by macrophages in vitro. AFM24 was also shown to be effective towards a variety of EGFR-expressing tumor cells, killing these regardless of their EGFR expression level and irrespective of their KRAS or BRAF, BRAF mutational status. In addition, as AFM24 has a lower affinity for EGFR and binds to a different epitope than cetuximab, it exerts an over 1,000-fold lower inhibitory activity on EGFR signaling, further underscoring its highly differentiated mechanism of action. Now, in terms of in vivo data, in tumor mouse models, we have published at ASCR this year's ACR showing dose-dependent anti-tumor activity of AFM24 in combination with freshly isolated NK cells. This anti-tumor activity for AFM24 in combination with NK cells has now also been demonstrated with pre-complex and cryopreserved NK cells in vitro 
and in vivo within one of our preclinical collaborations. This exciting data gives us confidence that the NK cell product we used in combination with AFM24 retains its potent anti-tumor activity after cryopreservation in vitro and in vivo. Now coming to the toxicology studies in Sino monkeys, also described in the paper, AFM24 was well tolerated up to the highest dose of 75 mg per kg when administered once weekly for 28 days. Remarkably, skin and other cytotoxicities which had been observed in these dose levels with cetuximab and comparable Sino monkey studies were not observed here. Only transient elevation of interleukin-6 levels was detected at all dose levels, which returned to baseline after 24 hours. Moreover, an increase in circulating CD40 monocytes was observed after the first dose of AFM24, concurrent with a decrease of circulating NK cells in doses of greater or equal to 8 milligrams per kg. In our view, showing the expected pharmacodynamic effect of this drug candidate. Now, taken together, these results emphasize the promise of our bispecific innate cell engagers as an alternative cancer therapy and demonstrate the potential for AFM24 to effectively target tumors expressing various varying levels of EGFR regardless of their mutational status. Happy to answer any questions you may have about this in our Q&A. And for now, I'll hand the call over to Angus to review the financials. Angus? Thank you, Arndt. AppyMed's consolidated financial statements have been prepared in accordance with IFRS as issued by the International Accounting Standard Board, or IASB. The consolidated financial statements are presented in euros, which is the company's functional and presentation currency. Therefore, all financial numbers that I will present in this call, unless otherwise noted, will be in euros. We entered the second quarter of 2021 with cash and cash equivalents of 222.7 million euros compared to 146.9 million euros on December 31, 2020. Based on our current operating plan and assumptions, we anticipate that our cash and cash equivalents will support operations into the second half of 2023. Net cash used in operating activities for the quarter ended June 30, 2021, was 17.3 million euros, compared to 15 million euros in the second quarter of 2020. Total revenue for the second quarter ended June 30, 2021, was 9.7 million euros, compared with 2.9 million euros for the quarter ended June 30, 2020. Revenue for the second quarter of 2021 mainly comprised collaboration revenue from Genentech and Royvant. Research and development expense for the second quarter of 2021 was 21.8 million euros compared to 11.7 million euros for the second quarter of 2020. The increase in R&D expenses compared to the same period last year were driven primarily by increased expenses for AFM24, including costs for the production of clinical trial material, uh, as well as an increase in costs associated with our other early stage programs and infrastructure and an increase in share-based payment expense. General and administrative expenses for the second quarter of 2021 increased by 109% to 5.4 million from 2.6 million in the second quarter ended June 30th, 2020. The increase relates largely to higher personnel expenses, higher premiums for our directors and officers liability insurance, higher consulting expenses, and increased share-based payment expenses. Net finance costs for the quarter ended June 30th, 2021 increased by 63% from 1 million in the quarter ended June 30th, 2020 to 1.6 million uh, during the second quarter of 2021. The increase is largely due to foreign exchange losses related to assets denominated in U.S. dollars as a result of the weakening of the U.S. dollar against the euro during the quarter. Net loss for the quarter ended June 30, 2021 was 18.8 million euros or 16 cents per common share compared with a net loss of 12.2 million euros or 16 cents per common share for the quarter ended June 30, 2020. The weighted number of common shares outstanding for the quarter ended June 30th, 2021 was 119.6 million. I will now turn the call back to Adi for closing remarks. Adi? Thanks a lot, Angus. Uh, as just explained, our company is making significant strides forward 
by advancing science and demonstrating that our inner telling agents can play a leading role in enabling innate immune cells to identify and uh, eliminate cancer cells. Now for AFM13, our strategy, development strategy, allows us to target a broad set of CD30 positive uh, lymphoma, indeed including various types of non-Hodgkin and Hodgkin lymphoma. We're very excited about the potential and market opportunity for AFM13 in these indications. And we will have additional data for the NK cell combination study by the uh, end of the year. For uh, AFM24, we're now executing a strategy that we believe, uh, we believe gives us the highest probability of success. We have uh, reached active dose levels in our dose escalation study and we'll now use this to initiate uh, this three-pronged development approach in parallel, indeed across a broad set of solid tumor indications. We expect that these uh, three studies will generate a continuous uh, flow of data. Finally, we are executing on our preclinical pipeline to bring additional product candidates into the clinic. Our development progress for AFM28 is indicative of our ability to further expand our pipeline by leveraging uh, the unique ROC platform, and we're working on additional early candidates from the platform. Many, many people have contributed to bring our innovative therapies to patients who need additional options in their fight to cancer. These include patients and their families who entrust us with the lives of their loved ones, our employees and the investors who over the years have supported our efforts. As always, I'm very thankful for the trust you put into our efforts. Thank you. We're now ready to take any questions that uh, you may have. Operator? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press the star, then the number one key on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Our first question comes from Dana Graybosch with SVB Lyrink. Hi all, thanks for the question and for the pretty nicely comprehensive uh, call. Uh, two for me on AFM24. The first is, I believe you mentioned, and I just want to confirm that you saw stable disease in several patients beyond eight weeks. And in that same sentence, you mentioned that you were recruiting any EGFR expressing solid tumors. I'm wondering if you could clarify whether you saw the stable disease in patients that had more EGFR expression. Was there any correlation with that? Or even if you could tell us of these patients recruited at cohort five and six, what proportion of them did have high EGFR, which ended up with low EGFR? Uh, that's the first question. And the second question is, can you confirm how you ultimately will select a dose given you haven't hit any dose limiting toxicity? Uh, can you, will you be going off uh, pharmacodynamic activation and periphery? What gives you confidence that that, uh, that that will track with your activity in the tumor? Will you be going off of uh, occupancy of CD16 or EGFR? or will you continue to try to dose as high as possible until you do understand uh, your highest tolerable dose? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. I have to check if Andreas uh, is uh, still on the phone. Andreas, could you follow the, uh, um, the questions? And uh, Okay, very good, Andreas. Yeah, I'm on the phone. I'm still apologize. I'm in rural Italy, so if, if I break up at some point, uh, it's, it's due to technology reasons, but I, I try to stay as long as I can. So um, let, let's start with the second part of the question first, and Arndt also uh, chime in. Um, so as we always said, the selection of our, our recommended phase two dose will be based on pharmacodynamic markers. Uh, as Arndt mentioned, our mechanism of action is completely different from uh, EGFR pathway targeting agents uh, like cetuximab or the TKI. So we were not expecting to see um, any dose-limiting toxicity like skin or mucosa. 
And uh, what, what we in fact see clinically is, is really uh, reconfirming this assumption. Uh, so IRRs remain the side effect which are well manageable, but we are not seeing any skin toxicity, any mucosal toxicity. Um, as we said, in terms of uh, pharmacodynamic markers, we have um, a whole array of parameters that we look at. Uh, the most leading parameters are markers of the activation of circulating NK cells as well as the occupancy of uh, the CD16A receptor, uh, where we see values that are well above uh, those values needed for experimental activity uh, in vitro and in vivo. So we feel uh, very confident that uh, we are currently working at pharmacodynamically active doses, and uh, this is our doses that we will take forward into phase two testing, both as a single agent as well as in combinations. Uh, irrespective of this, uh, we uh, may escalate one or two additional dose steps uh, just to confirm that we have a very good safety profile, a very good safety window, but not necessarily to use these higher doses for uh, further uh, evaluation of, of clinical activity. Um, in terms of EGFR expression, uh, we are collecting uh, the data Again, for the highest dose levels, we have not all data in-house. For the lower dose levels, uh, we could not see any correlation between the uh, degree of EGFR expression and any of the clinical parameters. But again, the, the data for the two highest dose levels in terms of EGFR quantification are still pending. Got it. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Maury Raycroft with Jefferies. Hi, uh, good morning everyone, good afternoon, and uh, uh, congrats on the progress and thanks for taking my questions. Um, also, one question on AFM24, you mentioned uh, additional inflection points for the program by the end of the year. Just wondering if you can recap uh, what those inflection points are. Um, yeah, so uh, the... Uh, as we've mentioned, we are now planning to uh, start the uh, dose expansion cohort. So that's an important milestone. And uh, we've also mentioned that uh, there are uh, two additional studies that uh, are being initiated. Uh, the one is the combination study with natural killer cells, and the other one is the uh, study with um, uh, atezolizumab. So these are three very important uh, inflection points in our mind. And in addition, we can provide updates uh, as we proceed with the dose escalation study. Uh, you've heard from uh, Andreas that uh, we have uh, expanded uh, the cohorts five and six to include more patients. Those data will be collected and analyzed. And uh, once available, we uh, plan to share this data with you. Got it. That's helpful. Maury? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still here, and um, just wondering if you're saying anything additional about um, any more specifics on the activation markers and uh, cytokine secretion that you're seeing, if you're providing any more specifics. Uh, Arndt? Yeah, uh, thanks, Maury. Good question. At this point, not specifically, we would like to share that. I mean, we have said, just to repeat maybe what Andres already said, we look at uh, activation and exhaustion markers on circulating in K cells. We look at infiltration of the cells in some of the biopsies we have. We will look at the cytokine levels. And of course, as we have reported, in addition to uh, exposure, so PK parameters also at receptor occupancy. And uh, we will share that in more detail once all the data, is, as Adi also mentioned, will be um, collected together, and then, then share, we'll also share the specific markers used. Got it. Okay. And then also I wanted to ask about the AFM13 plus NK cell combo. Um, can you say if you have responses at the highest dose at this point, and how many patients total at the highest dose are, are planned for the study? So we haven't disclosed any such details for the time being as, um, as we are uh, preparing for a uh, 
presentation later in the year as, uh, as outlined so that we can see the, the composite. But in short, what the, what the plan has been is that uh, we have uh, in each cohort initially three patients. Uh, and a cohort is always a, uh, a certain number of incasals, which is increased by a factor of 10 when the safety is warranted. And um, uh, as I said, it's 10 to the 6 cells per kilogram. We move to 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8. Uh, in these uh, patients, we haven't seen any those limiting uh, toxicities or any uh, any other side effects, so it appears uh, quite safe. And overall, what I can say here is that uh, we're also very encouraged by the responses that uh, we're seeing after the um, after the first assessment. Currently, uh, additional patients are treated, so we have uh, continued to enroll patients, or MD Anderson has continued to enroll patients uh, at the highest dose cohort. And that's currently ongoing. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. And then my last question, and then I'll hop in the queue. Um, in the prepared remarks, you said the program, the AFM 13 plus N case all combo program, would be robust and could enable discussions with regulators for approval strategies. I'm just wondering if you think you'll have enough data by year end 21 to enable these discussions. Uh, in terms of timing, uh, we've uh, been um, we, we will let you know as soon as um, we have such data. It's an IST, so we're dependent on MD Anderson uh, to enroll these uh, these patients. And uh, so I, I would say that we have to wait a, uh, for a little while before we can uh, confirm any of this uh, next uh, activities. Um, this is an important activity. But as we feel, it's not the uh, only very important activity. The other one is that we can uh, proceed with the encasals and its manufacturing. And uh, I was sh sharing two news today uh, that we have made good progress on, uh, on, on this front as well. First, uh, we're now working with the CDMO uh, for the manufacturing of the co-blood-derived encasals. And we have generated first data of a cryopreserved uh, AFM-13. Uh, uh, pre-complex in cases and determined its uh, activity in uh, in preclinical experiments. Got it. Okay. Congrats again, and thanks for taking my question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Nick Abbott with Wells Fargo. Oh, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking our questions. And uh, rural Italy sounds uh, delightful. I have to say. Um, just uh, starting off uh, maybe on, on AFM 13, um, you, you mentioned the CDMO, Adi. Uh, is this using cord blood from MD Anderson? Is, 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 obviously, I know that you've licensed the technology from them, but um, are you restricted to where the cord blood uh, uh, cells come from, which bank they come from? Mm -hmm. So yes, we have a license to the uh, entire technology. And uh, this would also include, indeed, any work on uh, crowd preservation that's been conducted by uh, MD Anderson. In terms of uh, core blood cells, we're not restricted to uh, any specific source. So we can source this uh, from MD Anderson, but also independent uh, places. And um, so in essence, uh, that's, how we, uh, that's how we are set up. Is there a specific reason why you're asking? No, not at all. Not at all. I'm just thinking if you were going to be, you know, I don't. We don't know where the CDMO is, but if you were going to have a CDMO in Germany, for example, then you know, shipping cold blood from MD Anderson wouldn't oh. be as convenient as sourcing yeah. it from yeah. somewhere in Germany. Yeah, yeah. No, it's an international CDMO, so that has footprint all over the world. So it's obviously one of the very experienced one uh, that was important to us. Again, and a CDMO that has already worked and uh, developed in KSL products. So we're tapping into uh, specific uh, know-how already with, uh, this, uh, with this choice. And uh, uh, at the moment, our focus is to work with a site in the US. Okay, great, thank you. And then just on AFM24, and uh, you know, terrific now, finally, details of those expansion cohorts. Um, one thing that struck me in the monotherapy, there's, there's not a KRAS mutated colorectal cohort. Um, you know, the NK combo would appear to allow for KRAS mutated uh, colorectal, but 
did you consider, is there a reason why there isn't a KRAS mutated cohort? Obviously, it couldn't be EGFR pretreated, and that's probably the reason, but I thought I'd ask. Uh, Andreas, can you help out here? Yeah, this is a good pick. Um, as we said, uh, our selection on the expansion cohorts are uh, based on a pretty thorough analysis of the uh, underlying tumor biology and the makeup of the different players of the innate immune system. Uh, when we look specifically at KRAS mutated colorectal cancer, it's not due to the KRAS mutation, but there appears to be a coincidence that many KRAS mutated colorectal cancers um, have very limited um, NK cell uh, numbers and, and some other factors that uh, indicated to us that uh, KRAS, KRAS mutated colorectal cancer would be one of these indications uh, where the patient would need support of an external NK cell source. And that's the reason why they ended up basically in study 103. Uh, we believe that uh, once you are able to supply these KRAS mutant uh, colorectal cancers with NK cells and with an appropriate um, engager, uh, that you put the innate immune system in, in the best position to, to work against this very difficult to treat tumors. Right. Thank, thank you very much. I'll hold back in the queue. As a reminder, that is star, then one, if you'd like to ask a question at this time. Our next question comes from Dale Chen with Laidlaw. Uh, good morning and afternoon, and uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, the first question is that for the FM13 plus the uh, core blood uh, in case cell, which that uh, according to clinical trial that uh, you have, it was expected to uh, include about 30 patients. Uh, is this target still what do you anticipate, or how has any modification on that, and uh, whether that potentially could be a critical mass for a potential sort of registration study, uh, discussion with FDA? Andrea, you may want to take that. Yeah, so the first thing that I can confirm is um, that the protocol is, is written in a way that we in fact, can recruit uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 patients um, at the recommended dose level. Uh, this could be a mixture of Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin CD30 uh, expressing lymphomas. Um, again, whether this uh, mass or with, uh, this number will uh, be sufficient for any registration uh, package, of course, will depend on the uh, effect level and uh, definitely uh, the study will allow us uh, probably even earlier than, uh, than going up to the full recruitment to engage in discussions with FDA. And I think during these discussions, we will learn uh, what, what kind of uh, patient numbers they are expecting. So I think it's a robust study. It will give you a pretty good uh, data set. We'll, be, we'll, we'll enable us also to look at different biologies within the CD30 uh, expressing lymphoma space. And everything else uh, will really depend on, on our initial discussions with FDA. Great, that's very helpful. Uh, maybe just a quick follow-up on this, which is that, is the data anticipated uh, reporting at ASH or other venues? Um, Again, the, the disclosure policy is uh, mainly driven by MD Anderson. Our expectation is that they uh, will submit uh, some of the data for, for ASH. Okay, great. And uh, maybe one general question for the AFM24. Uh, you have the monotherapy as well as the combo, specifically with NK uh, cell combo. Uh, I noticed that the renal cell carcinoma uh, was only a monotherapy, but not on the combo. Is there any uh, reason uh, behind that, or, or maybe more specific reason behind that? Yeah, the answer is, again, it's based on the analysis of biology um, and the setup of the different players of the innate immune system. 
clear cell carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, uh, we, we know already uh, since the interferon time that this is a tumor there where the uh, immune system can exert some tumor control. When we specifically looked at the players in the innate immune system, uh, we found that RCC uh, is a good candidate that could benefit from uh, monotherapy. So our first step here is to test monotherapy AFM24. Uh, we believe that several, please, uh, several important pieces are in place in RCC uh, that an innate cell engager could work as a monotherapy. Um, of course, if we should see good data that would not uh, preclude that at some point we may add a combination with an NK cell or a PD-1. But again, for, for the first evaluation, RCC looks as one of those tumors where monotherapy could be quite beneficial for these patients. Okay, great. And maybe the last question, which is a housekeeping one, that uh, in the second quarter of this year, the R&D expenditure as well as revenue has increased, uh, particularly R&D expenditure increased quite significantly compared to the prior quarter. Uh, so should we, for a modeling purposes, should we anticipate uh, the second quarter R&D expenditure will be something more as a base uh, moving uh, going forward for at least for the remaining of the year? And thanks for the... Yep. Thanks, thanks, Yale. So, I mean, a, a couple of comments there. I mean, one, we, we haven't provided specific guidance on our, our expenses, but um, we have provided guidance on our cash runway. Uh, and what we've said is that we expect our existing cash, which is about 200 and a uh, little over 220 million euros, uh, will, will last us uh, in, into the second half of 2023. So, um, you, you know, if you, if you do the math on that, you know, that's, that's kind of eight to, to ten quarters out. Um, uh, that implies a, a cash burn in the you know, low to mid-20s, uh, excluding any impact of additional proceeds from loans or milestones, et cetera. Um, so just doing based on that math, you can assume that, um, you know, the expenditure level that you're seeing in Q2 uh, of this year um, is, is probably more relevant uh, as we go forward than the expenses you've seen uh, in previous quarters, in particular um, the second quarter of last year. Um, but having said that, you know, we do expect that, um, you know, R&D expense will be lumpy, right? We, this quarter we've, we've had, um, as I said uh, on the call, we, we've, we had an increase in AFM 24. A lot of that's associated with uh, production of clinical trial material for uh, our ongoing study and upcoming studies. Um, uh, we've, we've also had ramp up since in our earlier stage programs like AFM 28 and AFM 32. Um, and, um, you know, when it comes to CMC investments, those, those can be a, a little bit lumpy, but, but long story short, um, fair, fair to assume that, uh, that the R&D expenditure this quarter is, is probably more, more in line with where we'll be in the future than, um, uh, you know, where we've been in the past. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And again, congrats for a lot of progress here. We have a follow-up question from the line of Nick Abbott with Wells Fargo. Great, uh, thanks for taking the follow-up. And uh, just just going back to the um, AFM24 trial, I, I believe that currently the trial is being conducted at four sites in the US, UK, and Spain. Um, and, and Adi, you mentioned a, a US CDMO. So can you talk maybe a little bit about you know the um, for the the three expansion cohorts? You know how many sites that you um, expect to be running those trials at, and whether they're going to be uh, international or all in the U.S. And will this be a Simon sort of two-stage design for each of the cohorts? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for this question, uh, uh, Nick. I'll have either Wolfgang or Andreas jumping in here if they can. Um, yeah, I can. <clears throat> so. Uh, for the uh, expansion course of the monotherapy trial, um, we are looking to increase the number of sites from four that we are currently having probably to um, somewhere between 10 and 15, 16 sites. Uh, we'll continue to be a mixture of uh, U.S. sites, international sites. Uh, you mentioned currently we have Europe. Uh, we will have a couple of sites in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, mainly Korea, uh, especially to recruit uh, EGFR mutant patients. 
Uh, now, the same is true for the uh, PD-1, uh, PDL-1 study, uh, where we will have also a mixture of uh, U.S. and uh, ex-U.S. sites. Uh, study 103, the SNK-01 study, uh, will initially be a U.S.-only study with up to four sites for the um, uh, initial part and then expanding a couple of more sites, but, but currently the plans for this specific study are to, uh, to be a U.S.-only study. Uh, now, in terms of the study design, uh, all studies are designed uh, according to uh, Simon two-stage principles. So we will have an initial phase with uh, a defined number of patients. Of course, as we are enrolling different uh, disease types, the uh, Go no go criteria will vary by uh, disease type, and then also the definition of a uh, response rate of interest will be a little bit different. But in, in general, um, as, as I said, this will be a two stage designs with an initial cohort of probably around 12 to 15 patients uh, looking at a predefined success criteria and then having the ability to enroll up to 30 to 35 patients per cohort uh, to verify the initial assumptions of the uh, Simon two stage design. Very terrific. Thank you very much. And that concludes today's question and answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in AFIMED's second quarter 2021 financial results and corporate update conference call. This concludes the program, and you may now disconnect. Everyone, have a great day.